president of the North American Catalysis Society. I'm true? Not quite. Quite <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Bereskov Institute to celebrate this 100th anniversary of Bereskov's uh, birth. Uh, just a reflection here for a moment that I came to the Institute the first time together with Val Hansel, uh, then Vice President of the firm ULP, and Joe Hightower, a professor of chemical engineering from Rice University in 1974 in the spring. And we were greeted here by Professor Boresco himself, entertained at his home and shown all the wonderful developments of the Institute at that time. And so in the past 33 years, I've had the pleasure of coming here quite frequently, and in the past several years, almost every year, or occasionally every other year. So it's a great pleasure to be back here and to see the wonderful accomplishments that the Institute has made, the result of the founding father, Georgi Konstantinovich Baryasko. I want to talk with you and share with you my ideas about the science of catalysis because not everyone in the technical world and certainly not everyone in the business world thinks that catalysis involves science. So let me begin by giving you what some people think is the general impression of the state of catalysis. And I have identified it as the state of catalysis prior to 1950 and you'll see why I've chosen that demarcation uh, line, somewhat arbitrarily, but appropriately. So prior to this time, the only thing that one can do if you wanted to visualize catalysis or a catalyst is to have a vision about it. Here you have a wise scientist creating his vision, happens to be a beautiful woman, but you can replace this figure by a beautiful catalyst. The reduction to practice was done in a laboratory, i show you this one here. This has an interesting origin, and if you ask me a question at the end of the lecture, I'll tell you whose laboratory it is. It's relevant to this program. Uh, you have the master working in the laboratory, largely transforming materials by warming them up in an oven and heating them, perhaps distilling them. And then you have the person sitting over here at the table who is the theoretician trying to take the best principles and understanding of the day and convert that into some theory of catalysis. Now, things have changed dramatically, particularly in the last 50 years, and they're the result of the things that I show you on this slide. Advances in catalyst preparation that allow us to make novel microporous materials, controlled synthesis of nanoparticles with controlled size, and in some cases even shape, Control synthesis of isolated catalyst sites, I'll show you some examples. Microphases, also control size and geometry. Catalyst characterization tools have advanced considerably here. We have a variety of spectroscopies and diffraction techniques using virtually every part of the spectrum here, from very short to very long wavelengths. And then in the area of reaction mechanisms and kinetics, we now know how to talk not only about overall kinetics, but to break down the kinetics into the individual pieces so that we can talk about microkinetics and analyze reactions in terms of specific elementary processes. And then even more recently, theoretical methods and computer speed have brought us to a point where we can use density functional theory other forms of quantum mechanics to describe the energetics and vibrational properties and structural properties of catalytic sites and absorbed species. Using transition state theory, we can access rate coefficients for reactions and finally assemble all of this so that we can now do ab initio microkinetic analysis. We can look at the structure of a catalyst and predict what kind of reaction rates we should expect. So here's an example, several examples of where we are today. On the left, upper left, is an array of nanoparticles of platinum produced by my colleague, Gabor Samarjai, 
Here you have individual particles seen by an atomic force microscope or a scanning tunneling microscope, uh, a, a few nano uh, meters in dimension. On the right is an example of looking at the chemical dynamics of an elementary process. This is very rapid infrared spectroscopy in which one can look at the infrared bands associated with these alkyl species and then by introducing a pulse of hydrogen follow the transformation of that alkyl into the uh, corresponding alkane. And you can see here the dynamics and the time constant. If you take the inverse of the time constant, you have the rate coefficient for this elementary process. And the last example is the uh, extent to which theory has advanced. Here we're looking at a small gold particle sitting on a surface of uh, magnesium oxide, and one is examining the details of how CO is transformed into CO2 at room temperature, and one is able to get the energetics and all the characteristics of this reaction. So we've come a long way from 1950 as a result of the tools that had been made available by a large number of scientists, many of them working here at the Breskov Institute. What I'd like to do is to talk about four examples from work that we have done in our laboratory. Three of these will be on heterogeneous catalysts, and the last will be on homogeneous catalysts. The first will concern copper um, zirconia, a novel type of catalyst for making methanol, and we'll address the effect of the phase of zirconia and what happens when we put cerium into the zirconia. We'll next look at converting methanol to dimethyl carbonate. We'll ask what is the structure of the active center. It'll turn out to be a cuprous cation that is charge exchanged into a zeolite. We'll also then turn and ask what is the mechanism of forming EMC, dimethyl carbonate, and how can we tease apart the details of this mechanism experimentally and theoretically. The third example of heterogeneous catalysis will be on a reaction that was studied by Varesco, the oxidation of methanol to formaldehyde. Interestingly enough, on vanadium, but in this case, not B205, but isolated vanadate species which are sitting on a platform of silica. And what we'll ask is, what are the details by which methanol is transformed into formaldehyde, and how is the catalyst reoxidized? The last example is for a homogeneous catalyst, and it happens to be for the, for the epoxidation of olefin, specifically cyclooctene, using hydrogen peroxide on iron porphyrins. And here the key question is, how can one control the microkinetics and individual steps by tuning the composition of the, these phenyl groups by substitution with the different halogens? What we'll see is that we're able to control the electron density on the iron center by modifying the phenyl groups surrounding the porphyrin ring. And this has profound effects on the activity and selectivity. So let me start with the first example, methanol synthesis on copper zirconia catalyst. The background here is about a decade's worth of work that we have done, in which we first showed that this is an active catalyst. If properly made, you can have activities comparable to or even slightly better than copper zinc oxide alumina, the traditional catalyst. The advantage is that this particular catalyst <coughs> is stable to a wide variety of CO to CO2 ratios, unlike the industrial catalyst, and will even operate in the presence of pure CO and hydrogen. Our studies show that this catalyst is different from the traditional catalyst in the sense that CO absorbs on the zirconia. This was shown by infrared spectroscopy. And CO hydrogenation occurs preferentially not on the copper, but on the zirconia, the copper serving as a source of atomic hydrogen by dissociative absorption of H2 and then spillover of hydrogen atoms onto the support of the zirconia. And so the work that uh, preceded the one I want to describe to you is shown here. Now I'm going to show you a series of cartoons of how the catalysis works. The surface of zirconia is covered by hydroxyl groups, which are reactive to CO. They form surface forming species, which we could see by infrared spectroscopy and follow the dynamics of forming these species. 
hydrogen associates with dissociates on the copper and then spills over onto the support. This could be followed by H2D2 exchange of these OH groups, so we can see these dynamics, a very rapid process. And here you have the spillover. And then hydrogen that is spilled over reacts with the formate to make a methoxide group. One can follow the dynamics of the conversion of formate species into methoxide species. And finally, there's a reductive elimination of the methoxide to form methanol. And the dynamics of methanol formation track exactly on time scale with the disappearance of the methoxide groups. So this preliminary work suggests that zirconia is a participant in the reaction, and that copper is there simply to provide atomic hydrogen. And so the question that we raised here is, can we affect the properties of this catalyst by changing the structure, the structure of the zirconia from tetragonal to monoclinic? I'll show you that yes, we can. And then a separate question we asked is, can we enhance the, the performance of this catalyst by doping Syria into zirconia? So I'll show you the first result. <clears throat> After two years of effort, we discovered how to make tetragonal and monoclinic zirconia, here are the crystal structures shown, that have exactly the same surface area, 150 square meters per gram. It involves lots of tricks of chemistry. In one case, you want to work in an acid medium. In the other, in a base medium, you have to digest the materials for a long time and calcine them in the right way. But once you've done this, you can put copper onto this material and with a controlled surface area of copper and look at the methanol synthesis activity under the conditions shown at the top over here. <clears throat> and what is notable is that if we look at the line here, these two points, or the copper and tetragonal zirconia, they're relatively inactive, but eightfold more active is the copper on monoclinic zirconia. And this demonstrates unambiguously that the phase of zirconia plays an important role. The reason for this is that the monoclinic zirconia absorbs hydrogen and CO much more strongly than the tetragonal zirconia, and as a result, we have a higher concentration of the reactants necessary to make methanol. Now, the next thing that we looked at was the substitution into the lattice of zirconia of atoms of Syria. And this can be done to a very large degree before one gets phase separation. And here you see the X-ray diffraction patterns as we start with the, uh, the original, just pure zirconia. And in this case, because of the way in which we prepare the zirconia, the bulk of the zirconia is in the tetragonal phase, and the surface has a small amount of monoclinic phase, which is shown up over here. If we look at the OH groups, we see a fingerprint representation of monoclinic, OH groups on monoclinic zirconia. As you add the syria, the peak shifts to lower angles, meaning that the lattice expands because of the larger cerium that you're introducing. Eventually, we get some small amount of cubic phase being formed, and ultimately, we have pure cubic cerium oxide. So now what we're going to look at is what happens when we put copper onto the surface of this material. So here's the composition of the cerium zirconium oxide, X representing the mole fraction of the ceria. Here is the uh, initial point for this hybrid zirconia, has been a core of tetragonal and a skin of monoclinic. And you see where it's positioned between the pure phases. And as we add more and more cerium, the activity goes up, reaches a peak at about half a cerium per uh, equivalent amount of cerium and zirconium, and then it declines as you put in more cerium. The selectivity reaches a maximum at about the same point of 98%, the only other product being methane. Interestingly, the activity at this peak value is 420 grams per kilogram per hour. That's an industrial unit. And if one looks at various industrial methanol synthesis catalysts, what you discover is this is near the peak of what is available industrially. So this is really a good catalyst. If we ask, how does this catalyst operate? Well, we can answer this in part by doing the various kinds of spectroscopies. 
we discover that the copper is always, independent of this amount of cerium, is always in the zero valence state. So we only have metallic copper. But the cerium undergoes partial reduction from the four plus to three plus state, and this is clearly seen by the Zanes pattern here. For this particular catalyst, which is near the peak in activity, 62% of the cerium is in the three plus state. Another fingerprint of change is the infrared spectrum of the hydroxyl groups. Here's pure zirconium, here's pure cerium. The mixtures are shown in between. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is that we start out with roughly equivalent amounts of terminal OH and bridging OH groups. Here are the terminal ones, here are the bridging ones. And as you add more and more cerium, as you go up to the peak in activity, the terminal groups disappear, and we have only bridging groups. <coughs> and the metal atoms in the bridging groups now switch from largely zirconium to largely cerium. And this changes the character of these OH groups, and in fact strengthens their interaction with the, OH, with the carbon monoxide coming in. And here I'll show you again the same series of panels. <coughs> the CO chem resorption capacity, which is increasing monotonically upwards as we add cerium, but more importantly you see a tenfold rise in the hydrogen chemisorption capacity as we go up to the maximum activity after which the uh, chemisorption capacity declines slightly. And finally, when we put all of this together, we find that we have this kind of a cycle that is involved first in CO absorption to make the formate group, the hydrogenation to make the methoxide, and the last step, which is characterized by K1 prime, the rate coefficient here, is the release of the methanol. And so if we look at how this rate coefficient varies with the amount of cerium in the zirconia, you see it passes to a maximum as is for the overall activity, and this correlates roughly with the chemisorption amount of hydrogen. So chemisorption of hydrogen <coughs> is an important part of the story, and that chemisorption has to happen on the surface of the zirconia. So this first illustration was chosen to show you how, by understanding the mechanism of a catalyst, one can begin to think in an intelligent fashion about how to make improvements, first through the change in phase of the zirconia, and then secondly, through the substitution of cerium into the zirconia lattice. Let's move now to the second example. And this concerns the oxidative carbonylation of methanol. So we've already made the methanol, and we want to move down this path to dimethyl carbonate, which is an interesting material as a possible octane enhancer for gasoline, a methylating agent, and an intermediate in making carbonate polymers. It's what one would call a green chemical. Another two uh, products that can be formed are methyl formate, a solvent, and dimethoxymethane. But for the, the purposes of the next example, we're only going to look primarily at this line over here. It's been found in the literature, both the patent literature and the scientific literature, that substituted zeolites are active. And in particular, copper Y zeolite is very active for making the desired compound dimethyl carbonate. For reasons I won't go into, if one works with, say, copper mortonite, one can make large amounts of dimethoxymethane. That's also interesting, but it's outside the scope of what I'd like to tell you about. So the questions we're going to address is what's the environment of the copper cations? Can we identify where they sit? what valence they have, how far are they from the zeolite, what are the likely pathways by which DMC, DMM, and methyl formate are formed. Uh, there's a third question which I won't address, which is why copper Y is the most active catalyst. So the catalysts that we're interested in were all prepared by what is called drying exchange, solid state exchange, in which you take HY zeolite, properly dried, dry cuprous chloride, you mix a stoichiometric mixture of these two compounds together, and you heat it programmatically up to as high as 1,000 degrees Kelvin. And what you can follow with a mass spectrometer is the evolution of HCl, as the copper cuprous chloride reacts with the proton, 
The proton is transferred to the chlorine, and the cuprous cation is left on the zeolite. And if you integrate the signal of HCl coming off the zeolite, it's exactly equivalent to the number of protons you would calculate being there based on the aluminum content of the zeolite. Confirmation of the exchange is also available through infrared spectroscopy. Here are the two OH groups characteristic uh, Bronsted acid sites in HY. At the beginning of the exchange process and at the end, they're completely gone. And here's the Zane spectrum of the copper K edge. And you can see this characteristic peak, which is uh, then differentiated. And the position of this peak is exactly a textbook example of what you would expect for copper 1. There's no evidence of copper 2, which would give us a small peak over here. We've also done extensive Zanes and x axis analysis <coughs> using on low energy x-rays to look at the aluminum K edge. So we're probing the gray sphere over here, which is the aluminum, and looking at backscattering from oxygen and from the copper, the pink sphere over here. And then a high energy x axis shown on the right at 9 kiloelectron volts to probe the environment of the copper. And so you can triangulate from the aluminum and from the copper perspective and get the exact details of the geometry here. The distance of copper to oxygen, oxygen to aluminum, and copper to aluminum. And it turns out that these distances that we extract from XNFs can be corroborated by density functional uh, calculations if we carry a calculation out on the cluster that I'm outlining over here. So at the end of these experiments and these calculations, we have a very precise understanding that all the copper is exchanged as copper to one cations, and they're exactly where I'm showing you. So now to catalysis. <clears throat> this is an active catalyst. I show you here the influence of the partial pressure of CO, methanol, and oxygen on the formation of various products. But I really want to draw your attention to the line I'm outlining here, which is for the formation of DMC. So there's nearly a first order dependence in the rate of formation of DMC, dimethyl carbonate, on CO partial pressure, indicating that that's a critical component. A small negative dependence on methanol partial pressure, suggesting that we're nearly saturated uh, by methanol uh, on the catalyst, and virtually zero dependence on oxygen. So this suggests that introduction of CO into the reaction system is somehow important. And this will be confirmed by the transient response experiments that I'm going to show you next. So what we've done is to take the catalyst, copper y zeolite, first expose it to methanol plus oxygen, and look at the infrared spectrum. What we see initially are lines for molecularly adsorbed methanol, which are shown by the arrows over here. And with time, there's the appearance of additional lines in the CH stretching region that are characteristic of a cuprous methoxide structure being formed. And at this point, the only products that come out of the reactor that are observed by mass spectrometry is dimethy dimethoxy methane. There's no DMC since there's no CO in the system. And so our analysis shows that what happens first in the presence of oxygen is the formation of these methoxide groups that might be accompanied either by a second methoxide group, this is a stable structure shown by DFT calculations, or alternatively by OH groups. Now next, we look at the dynamics of the formation of these methoxide groups, and we see that this is a rather rapid reaction that is to a large extent over in about five to 10 minutes. We're gonna contrast this with some of the other steps that occur here in just a minute. The next step is to flush out the methanol and oxygen with helium. I don't show you that spectrum. But then we introduce CO. This is the next portion of the, uh, the chemistry. And we immediately see a number of relatively complex changes. And I don't have the time to go into the details of this part of the spectrum. But if you begin to look at all the lines that are formed and look in the literature for their assignment, the best possible assignment is to this monomethyl carbonate. It's this structure over here. This is the mono 
methoxy, uh, uh, the monomethyl carbonate structure. Here's the carbonate in the middle, the methyl group over here. And that structure is formed slowly. Some methanol desorbs and can release EMC, which we see appearing now in the gas phase. There's also the possibility that CO is directly interacting with this dimethoxide structure to make EMC. Notice that the dynamics here for making EMC are slow, consistent with the suspicion that CO addition into the system, into the surface system, is right limited. So here I show you the next transient. Here is the formation of the MMC, the methoxy, monomethoxy carbonate. That's a slow process compared to the formation of the methoxide. And with about the same time constant is the disappearance of the methoxide. So what this suggests is that the introduction of CO is leading to an insertion of CO into this copper oxygen bond to make MMC. Now we look at the last bit of chemistry after we flush the CO out of the helium. Now we reintroduce methanol and oxygen. There's a very complex set of transformations that occur over here. I won't go through the details. But one can understand that what is happening here is the reaction of MMC with gas phase methanol now directly to make adsorbed DMC, which then comes off into the gas phase. And now we see a large burst of DMC. Notice this is a logarithmic scale, not a linear scale. And so the desired product comes off the surface. So if I try to summarize this, I see here the rapid formation of methoxide, slow consumption of methoxide to make MMC, and then the very rapid consumption of the remaining MMC and the reformation of the methoxide and methanol and oxygen are added at the end. So CO introduction is the slow and rate limiting step. And here we summarize all of that chemistry. Schematically, a reversible absorption of methanol to make methoxide groups here after they interact with individual uh, oxy uh, uh, copper structures. Here's the second interaction with methanol to make the dimethoxide. And shown in red, then, are the two rate limiting steps in the first case to form MMC, in the second case involving the dimethoxide direct formation of DMC. So this is an illustration of how one can tease apart the details of the chemistry using experiments done in a dynamic mode using both mass spectrometry and in situ infrared spectroscopy. And while I don't show it, we've also done density functional theory calculations on these rate limiting steps. And we find that the rate coefficients and the rates at which these reactions proceed are completely consistent with what we see experimentally. So this gives further confirmation that these, in fact, are the rate limiting steps. Oops. Okay. So here we are. We've looked at the formation of DMC. The other two products are dimethoxymethane. We have evidence, which I won't show you, that that involves an interaction of formaldehyde made in situ by partial oxidation of methanol with a methoxide group. We're going to make a hemiacetal and then subsequent interaction with another mole or molecule of methanol to make EMM and leave us with a hydroxyl group on the surface. And then finally over here is the formation of methylformate, MF, and that we believe involves just the condensation of two formaldehyde groups by what is called a Tyshenko uh, mechanism. So let me proceed now to the third example, also involving heterogeneous catalysis. In this case, we're going to look at a simple reaction, which is the oxidation of methanol to formaldehyde in water. Now, several groups, principally that of Israel Wax at Lehigh University and our own group have shown that this catalysis will occur on isolated vanadate groups that look like this attached to the surface of silica. And the kinetics are extremely simple. They're just first order in methanol, zero order in oxygen, suggesting that the reoxidation of the catalyst is very rapid and not kinetically important. 
And in situations where studies done by both groups suggest that what happens is that methanol interacts with one of the vanadium oxygen silicon bonds to make a vanadium methoxide group of the hydrogen that are transferring here to make a silanol. And then by some means, one of the hydrogen atoms on the methoxide group is transferred away uh, to the vanadium and we release formaldehyde. So the question now is the following. How can we represent the isolated site? So we'd like to do a quantum mechanical model. What's a good model, physical model? What is the likely pathway by which formaldehyde is formed? And how is the catalyst reoxidized? It's been assumed that it's very rapid, and all the experimental evidence shows that, but in fact, how does it occur? And I'll show you there's a surprise here. So the model we have used is to position a mono a, an isolated vanadate group over here on the corner of Sosesqui oxane. And this is a cube made of silica. And so we just cut off one corner of the cube and replace it with the vanadate over here. And we ask, is this a good model? Well, one way to check is to compare theory and experiment. So we look at the distances of the vanadyl bond, the vanadium oxygen bond, the frequency of the vanadyl group over here, uh, and some bands in the infrared associated with the vibration of the silica here, rings within the silica. And you can see that in all instances, there's very, very good agreement on both geometry and vibrational properties. So this encouraged us to now look at how this species might interact with methanol. And I show that to you here. Uh, there are two fundamental ways in which a methoxide on vanadium can be formed. So here's the initial structure. The yellow ball here is the vanadium. Uh, the geometrically preferred pathway is to form structure two, in which the methoxide is here. Here's the cyanol group. Uh, the delta G of formation of this, react of this product is 12 and a half kilocalories, so it's uphill. <coughs> But a more thermodynamically stable product would be this isomer, which I'm showing you over here, in which the vanadyl group is facing the hydroxyl, so there's some hydrogen bonding occurring over here. This is still uphill thermodynamically. Free energy is now only 3 kilocalories uphill, so it's accessible. And you can see, based on energy, this is the preferred position, or preferred structure. So the question is, which of these two structures is the one that one would observe experimentally? One way to check that is to look at the vibrational frequencies of the methyl groups over here and of the carbon, oxygen, vanadium stretch. And I show you these uh, two features in this little table. So here are the theoretically calculated vibrational frequencies for species two on the left, species two prime on the right, and here are the experiments. And it's immediately obvious that there's near perfect agreement here with structure 2 prime, which is the one we would predict to be thermodynamically most stable. And then there is the next question of how do you go from 2 to 2 prime, since 2 is what is accessible geometrically upon absorption. It turns out that, the path, that there is a pathway to go from here to here, but it has an activation barrier of 48 kilocalories per mole, which is prohibitive. What we discovered is that, in fact, what happens is that the second unit of methanol adds to a second vanadium oxygen silicon bond to make this dimethoxide, and then with a very low energy of activation for rotation, we can rotate this structure, release the methanol, and get the desired two prime structure. And this pathway takes practically no energy. So, in fact, these two structures then are in equilibrium, and as I'll show you later, there's an equilibrium between the gas phase and this structure over here, which is the thermodynamically preferred one. So here we are, we have our structure. We're going to absorb methanol on it reversibly. Notice the energies of formation and the Gibbs free energies of formation. This is the structure that we see experimentally. Now what we find is the difficult step is the transfer of one of these hydrogen atoms to the vanadyl group to make this formaldehyde, which is still bound to the, bound to the vanadium, and now a VOH group. The activation barrier here is 39.8 kilocalories per mole. 
We can now desorb the formaldehyde, giving us a, a, a hydroxyl group attached to vanadium and one attached to silicon. Uh, that has a relatively low barrier, nearly zero. And then we can desorb water by condensation of the two um, hydroxyl groups to give us the vanadium 3 plus uh, as the final product. And the water, that also has a small activation barrier, which is 14 and a half kilocalories per mole. So following this pathway, I've made formaldehyde and water. And if I map this out on a free energy plane, here's what I would see. Here's the reversible step of absorption with a small delta G uphill. Here's the rate limiting step to make the uh, precursor to formaldehyde, release of formaldehyde, and ultimately the uh, uh, production of water. Here we note that if you assume that the first step is in equilibrium, this is the rate limiting step, which it certainly will be when we have low levels of formaldehyde, then it's easy to show that the rate of formaldehyde formation is first order in methanol concentration, and the apparent rate coefficient, the one that you would measure experimentally, is a product of the equilibrium constant for the first step and the rate coefficient for the second. So now, before I show you the calculations for those, uh, uh, the apparent rate coefficient, I want to look at the reoxidation process. So here's the vanadium 3 plus, and in this structure, I position a second vanadium 3 plus on the other side of the cube. You'll see why. When you add oxygen to it, it forms a peroxide, which I'm outlining over here. This has no activation barrier, and it's thermodynamically downhill. The next thing we discovered is that what happens very readily with a small activation barrier is the we leave one of the oxygens behind to make a vanadyl group, and we now make a vanadium peroxyl silicon bridge, which is shown in the side of the red circle. And then you can continue the story and move the peroxide one step further, so it's now between a silicon, oxygen, oxygen, silicon. One would think that perhaps this is impossible. We, we discovered much to our interest that physicists have been looking at this process and discovered that it is the primary way by which oxygen diffuses in silica. And that the activation barrier that we calculate, 28 kilocalories, is within 2 kilocalories of what is calculated by the physicists using other quantum chemical techniques. And the transition state that we calculate, which looks like this, is identical to what has been seen in the physics community. So this is, in fact, a plausible step here. And then that peroxide moves to, towards the bottom of the structure, where now the peroxide sits between a vanadium and a silicon atom. And finally, we take it all the way over here to the point where we have now restored two vanadyl groups. This has an extremely small activation barrier. So the trouble point, or the sticking point, is right over here. But notice that the activation barrier is still some 10 kilocalories per mole lower than it is for the process of reducing uh, methanol or oxidizing methanol to make the formaldehyde. If you look at the rate coefficient for making formaldehyde, it's roughly 8 times 10 to the minus 2 reciprocal seconds. But the rate coefficient for this step here going from 7 to 8 is four orders of magnitude higher in magnitude. So reoxidation, in fact, is a rapid process. What about the value of four orders of magnitude? Well, in a different context, when we studied the oxidative dehydrogenation of propane and ethane on vanadate species, we also found experimentally factors of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 in terms of the ratio of reduction to reoxidation. So, in fact, reoxidation is fast, and the quantum calculations are of the right order of magnitude. Well, now, let's compare theory and experiment. This is always a good check to make sure everything is going right. So, we have calculated the heat of absorption for methanol uh, from in-situ infrared spectroscopy measurements. It's minus 13.4 kilocalories per mole. The value we get from theory is 15.5, 2 kilocalories per mole higher, which is well within the accuracy one expects for DFP. Here's a comparison of the calculated and the observed equilibrium constant for absorption. So we're within a factor of one and a half, which is very good for him. And at the bottom, we have the apparent 
activation energy, the apparent free exponential factor, and the apparent first order rate coefficient. Uh, these numbers are obtained in the following way. The apparent activation energy is just the sum of the activation energy for the rate limiting step, 39.8 kilocalories per mole, and the activation energy for absorption, which is fi minus 15.5. So that's how you get to 24.3. Notice it's in excellent agreement, well within experimental accuracy, of what we have measured. We calculate the pre-exponential factor in the following way, by taking the pre-exponential factor for the rate limiting step and for the equilibrium absorption of methanol using absolute rate theory and statistical mechanics. Uh, we're well within a factor of two, better than a factor of two in agreement. And then when we look at the value of the apparent rate coefficient, this is for 650 degrees Kelvin, we're well within a factor of two. We're actually only, uh, this uh, number here is 80% of the experimental uh, observed value. And if you look, like to look at a broader temperature range, here's an Arrhenius plot showing red are the uh, is the line, the Arrhenius line, that one would draw through two sets of data, one for two-tenths of a vanadium per square nanometer, the other one for four-tenths of a vanadium per square nanometer. You see the turnover frequencies are essentially identical. So, in fact, we are operating with isolated vanadate groups, and shown in black, then, is the theoretically calculated value, and this is underestimated by about 20%. So there's a very small mismatch here, and the activation barrier is dictated by the slope, but this is an agreement. Now, I come to my last example, and this one I've chosen to illustrate how one can tune the activity of, say, an iron center sitting in a porphyrin ring by working with the composition of the phenyl rings that surround the porphyrin, or four phenyl rings. The reaction we're going to look at is the epoxidation of an olefin, particularly cyclooctane to make the epoxide. There's no other organic product formed in this case. And that's this line. This is the, the desired process. The undesired process is simply decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to make water and oxygen. So the issue of selectivity is relative to hydrogen peroxide. The desired chemistry for the organic is to make the epoxide. And what we'd like to do is propose a mechanism that is consistent with all observable reaction kinetics uh, and describes these kinetics, and then relate the effects of the phenyl group composition to the rate coefficients that we deduce from these experiments uh, uh, for the epoxidation of the olefin and the decomposition of the peroxide. So the first thing that we discovered as we started this, uh, these investigations is that this material, which exists as a chloride salt, <clears throat> notice that the porphyrin ring has two negative charges on it. The iron is three plus. They need one more compensating anion, and that's usually a chloride. If one puts this into acetonitrile, an apolar solvent, you don't decompose any hydrogen peroxide. You also don't get any epoxidation. The catalyst is completely inactive. And only when we add progressively larger amounts of methanol does the catalyst become active for both reactions. The reason for this is that methanol turns out to be a better solvent for dissociating the salt into the cation and the anion. How do we know this? We can do proton NMR spectroscopy looking at the protons, the beta pyrrole protons that are situated around the porphyrin ring. And so in the absence of methanol, or very little methanol, we see principally one peak here at about 82 ppm, which is characteristic of the beta pyrrole proton in the associated salt. And then this shifts to something like 63 ppm when we add methanol, which is associated with the, port, the uh, proton attached to the porphyrin lens. This becomes a free cutoff. And also, you know, carries a solvent molecule in its coordination sphere. So what we did was to postulate that this is the correct chemistry, write the equilibrium statement like this, fit the experimental data that we got from NMR, and actually calculate the rate coefficient, or the equilibrium coefficient, and decompose it into its entropic and uh, entropic and enthalpic 
parts. And what we discovered is that the enthalpy of dissociation here, sorry, the entropy of dissociation is independent of the solvent composition, but the enthalpy is linearly dependent upon the amount of methanol that we have present. And notice that these numbers are small. Uh, in the absence of methanol, six kilocalories per mole, and this drops to about four kilocalories per mole in pure methanol. And we've recently been able to show, theoretically, by first principles, that these numbers are, in fact, consistent. They're not just the parameters that we get from a data fit. And this is work that was done by Rustam Khaniwudin. Uh, it has now work that is about to be published in the Journal of Physical Chemistry. So here I just show you that this very simple model with the parameters shown on the preceding slide describes the results uh, for either methanol variation in concentration or porphyrin. As we look at the concentration of the iron uh, cation over here containing methanol. <coughs> Now we look at the reaction mechanism. So this is the part that we just studied. Uh, what we find is that hydrogen peroxide then interacts or coordinates with the cation, and then it coordinated hydrogen peroxide. That's at equilibrium described by equilibrium constant K2. Two paths can now be followed, and you can break this oxygen, oxygen bond heterolytically to go here and make this radical cation oxo species, which is the precursor for oxidation. How do we know this? Well, we haven't been able to observe this, but Larry Kay in the US, University of Minnesota, has been able to see the structure, actually synthesize it, and follow its reaction with olefins and show that it produces oxidation. And Sasson Shea at the Hebrew University has shown that to be the case theoretically. The other pathway is homolytic cleavage of the oxygen-oxygen bond, which produces a hydroxyl radical. And we then get this hydroxyl cation, iron-4 cation. And that's a precursor for decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to oxygen and water. So we've been able to take this mechanism and by a series of uh, pre-designed experiments, isolate the equilibrium and rate coefficients for all the elementary steps. And when you put it all together, what you see is that this set of, this mechanism and set of parameters very nicely describes the formation of the epoxide as measured by gas chromatography, and the loss of hydrogen peroxide as measured by in situ proton NMR, which is a technique which we developed uh, in a side project. And this system also predicts properly that if you leave out the olefin, so that you shut down this reaction pathway, you can follow the, de the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, which also involves a crossover reaction here, uh, K6, uh, and that those dynamics are now even faster, and they're captured just as accurately as the dynamics where the olefin is present. So now we want to go to the more interesting part, which is to ask, what happens when I start changing the degree of halogenation on these phenyl groups. And here are the various compounds we've looked at. The one we've considered so far is the perchlorinated phenyl ring. Here's a shorthand uh, signature for each of these compounds. And now we'll look one by one at how changing the phenyl group composition, shown here, affects this whole scheme. So I've highlighted in red the parameter that I want you to look at. The first one is the equilibrium constant for dissociation. You'll notice that it's best for the dichlorophenyl group, and it's actually not very good for the perchlorinated uh, phenyl group. And the reason is that the dichlorophenyl, and also its cousin, the dichloro, uh, have the chlorine and the chlorine atoms close enough to the orphan ring, so that there's some overlap electron density from these two uh, uh, halogens with the porphyrin, adding electron density to the ring, which helps to stabilize the cation. So dissociation would actually be preferred. And remember, we need to have a dissociated halide salt here uh, in order to get an active uh, Lewis acid. Now contrast this with the effect on the other parameters. This is K3K2, which describes this reaction, the desired heterolytic cleavage 
K4, K2 describes the undesired homolytic cleavage. If you go across the road, you discover that things get better systematically as I go down to the perchlorinated phenyl group. And the reason is that this group has the additional chlorine group that's at the back end of the phenyl, and these act as electron withdrawing groups. And the net effect is that we make the catalyst better and better for both homolytic and heterolytic cleavage, but more importantly, the ratio of K3 over K4 increases, so we now increase the sensitivity or the preference selectivity to make the epoxide versus decomposing hydrogen peroxide. And then almost last here is K6 over K7, K7 being the desired rate coefficient to go to epoxidation, K7 being the crossover here. In this case, we want to keep this ratio small, and we notice that the ratio becomes small systematically as we go from left to right. So again, the perfluorinated ring is the preferred one. And here we put it all together, <clears throat> and we look at the observed rate of forming the epoxide, and you can see there's a two order of magnitude increase as we go from left to right. And again, it's the perfluorinated uh, group that turns out, even though it's not the best group for dissociating the uh, the porphyrin salt in the first step. So there's a trade-off, as we say over here, uh, it, 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 and the, there are compensating effects when you add, change the degree of halogenation. So it is important to maintain Lewis acidity of the iron-3, but it's also important to have electron withdrawing groups on the side. And notice that the selectivity to the epoxide for the uh, utilization of hydrogen peroxide is altered by a factor of nearly two. So let me summarize here with a couple of slides. I'm showing you in the first example that copper uh, zirconia, or Syria zirconia, here is a very interesting catalyst. It's a bifunctional catalyst. And the, the addition of cerium to the structure of zirconia changes the activity by quite a large amount. The second example on methanol oxidative carbonylation, I've shown you that the active center now is a copper cation, specifically a cuprous cation. Adsorbed CO is rapidly displaced by the formation of these methoxide groups. We didn't talk about it, but that in fact is the case. And the rate limiting step is CO insertion into this copper oxygen bond on the methoxide. Then we talked about oxidation of methanol to formaldehyde on isolated vanadate groups. I showed you that the rate limiting step in this case is the transfer of a proton from a methoxide group to a vanadyl oxygen and that the reoxidation of the vanadium-3 at the close of the cycle that makes formaldehyde to back to vanadium-5 plus involves migration of a peroxide group. This is a discovery and a rather interesting one because it, it resolves an issue that's been in the literature for many years. Most catalytic scientists think that reoxidation is a trimolecular process involving a mole of oxygen and two moles of reduced vanadate species. We showed that is absolutely incorrect, uh, that this is a bimolecular process. And then in the last example concerning the iron three porphyrins, we've shown that the porphyrin must first associate to become catalytically active, and it's active as a Lewis acid cation. And that the activity and the selectivity of this material is strongly influenced by the composition of these phenyl groups, which in turn dictate the electronic charge of the iron. So let me end in here by acknowledging the ones who did the work, uh, various students and postdocs. Ian Fisher got uh, started in the area of methanol synthesis. This was followed by Michael Rhodes and Konstantin Kaprowski. Uh, Ian Drake, Yihua Zhang, and Xiaobo Chang worked on the oxidative carbonylation of methanol, the first two on the experimental part, the last one on the theory. Jason Bronkema did the experimental work on methanol oxidation on isolated vanadates, and Anthony Goodrose did the work on theoretical work. Ned Stevenson did the experimental work associated with the iron-3 porphyrins and oxidation, and Rustam Hayyuri uh, is the one who did the associated theoretical work. I also want to point out that two of these individuals, Kosti Pakrovsky and Rustam Hayyuri, are from Russia. There are graduate students, one in chemical engineering, the first, and the second one in chemistry, 
who came to work in my group via the Higher Chemical College in Moscow as a result of a collaboration and friendship that I had with Vadim Kazansky there. So I'm very happy to have had these two individuals. Uh, Kostya has already gone to work, and Rustam is about to begin a postdoc in Germany, and then we'll seek an academic position. Finally, I need to acknowledge that the work was supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, and also by the corporation BP through something they call the Methane Conversion Cooperative. So once again, thank you to everyone here on the organizing committee for inviting me to come to this wonderful conference. I'm looking forward to the rest of the week and interacting with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, too. Uh, 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 Alexis, uh, thank you very much once again. First of all, for coming to here to participate to this conference, and uh, from uh, the organizing committee, we have a small gift to you. Well, uh, this is uh, the book by Boreskov uh, written in English. Thank you for uh, the keynote presentation and 